Hi everyone, it's Cassie, the Young Teen Librarian at East Hampton Library. Tonight we are continuing with reading through Cheaper by the Dozen, and we are continuing with Chapter 12, The Rena. Dad acquired the Rena to reward us for learning to swim. She was a cat boat, 20 feet long and almost as wide. She was docile, dignified, and ancient. Before we were allowed aboard the Rena, Dad delivered a series of lectures about navigation, tides, the magnetic compass, seamanship, rope splicing, right of way, and nautical terminology. Radar still had not been invented. It is doubtful if, outside the Naval Academy at Annapolis, any group of Americans ever received a more thorough indoctrination before setting foot on a cat boat. Next followed a series of dry runs on the front porch of the shoe. Dad, sitting in a chair and holding a walking stick as if it were a tiller, would bark out orders while maneuvering his imaginary craft around a tricky harbor. We'd sit in line on the floor alongside of him, pretending we were holding down the windward, windward rail. Dad would rub imaginary spray out of his eyes and scan the horizon for possible sperm whale, flying Dutchman, or floating em ambergris. Great point light off the larboard bow, he'd bark. Haul in the sheet and we'll try to clear her on this tack. He'd ease the handle of the cane over toward the imaginary leeward rail and two of us would haul in an imaginary rope. Steady as she goes, dad would command. Make her fast. We'd make believe to twist the rope around a cleat. Coming about, he'd shout. Low bridge, ready about, hard a lee. This time he'd push the cane handle all the way over toward the leeward side. We'd duck our heads and then scramble across the porch to man the opposite rail. Now we'll come up and pick up our mooring. You do that at the, at the end of every sail. Good sailors always make the mooring on the first try. Landlubbers sometimes have to go around three or four times before they can catch it. He'd stand up in the stern, the better to squint at the imaginary mooring. Now, let go your sheet, Bill. Stand by the center board, Mart. Up on the bow with the boat hook, Anne and Ernestine, and mind you, grab that mooring. Stand by the throat, Frank. Stand by the peak, Fred. We'd scurry around the porch, going through our duties, until at last Dad was satisfied his new crew was ready for the high seas. Dad was never happier than when aboard the Rena. From the moment he climbed into our dory to row out to Rena's mooring, his personality changed. On the Rena, we were no longer his flesh and blood, but a crew of landlubberly scum shanghaied from the taverns and flesh pots of many exotic ports. Rena was no scowl like catboat, but a sleek foremaster, bound around the horn with a bone in her teeth in search of rare spices and the priceless treasure of the Indies. He insisted that we address him as Captain instead of Daddy, and every remark must, must needs be civil and end with a Sir. It's just like when he was in the army, Ernestine whispered. Remember those military haircuts for Frank and Bill? And all that business of snapping to attention and learning to salute and the kitchen police? Avast there, you swabs, Dad hollered. No mutinous whispering on the poop deck. Anne, being the oldest, was proclaimed first mate of the Rena. Ernestine was second mate, Martha third, and Frank fourth. All the younger children were able-bodied seamen who, presumably, ate hardtack and bunked before the mast. Seems to be blowing up, mister, Dad said to Anne. I'll have a reef in that main in that mainsail. Aye, aye, sir. The Rena's just got one sail, Daddy, Lil said. Is that the mainsail? Quiet, you landlubber, or you'll get the merry rope's end. Of course it's the mainsail. The Mary's merry rope's end was no idle threat. Able-bodied seamen or mates who failed to leap when Dad barked an order did in fact receive a flogging with a piece of rope. It hurt, too. Dad's mood was contagious, and soon the, soon the mates were as dogmatic and as full of invective as he, when dealing with the sneaking pickpockets and rum pals, palsy derelicts who were their subordinates. And somehow, Dad passed along to us the illusion that, that the placid old Reno was a taut ship. I'll have those halyards, halyards coiled, he told Anne. Aye, aye, sir. 
Come on, you swabs, look alive now, or shiver my timbers if I don't keel haul the lot of you. Sometimes, without warning, Dad would start to bellow out, bellow out tuneless chanties about the 15 men on a dead man's chest, and especially one that went, he said heave, he said heave her two, she replied, make it three. If there had been any irons aboard, they would have been occupied by the fumbling landlubber or scurvy swab who forgot his duties and made Dad miss the mooring. Dad felt that to, have, that to have to make a second try for the mooring was the supreme humiliation, and that fellow yachtsmen and professional sea captains all along the waterfront were splitting their sides laughing at him. He'd drop the tiller, grow red in the face, and advance rope, and advance rope in hand on the offender. More than once, the scurvy swab made a panic-stricken dive over the side, preferring to swim ashore, where he would cope ultimately with Dad, instead of meeting the captain on the latter's own quarterdeck. On one occasion, when Dad blamed missing a mooring on general inefficiency and picked up a merrier ropes, a merry rope's end to inflict merry mass punishment, the entire crew leaped simultaneously over the side in an unrehearsed abandoned ship maneuver. Only the captain remained at the helm, from which vantage point he hurled threatening reminders about the danger of sharks and the penalties of mutiny. On that occasion, he brought Rena up to the mooring by himself, without any trouble, thus proving something we had long suspected. That he didn't really need our help at all, but enjoyed teaching us and having a crew to order around. Through the years, old Rena remained phleg phlegmatic, paying no apparent attention to the bedlam which had intruded into her twilight years. She was too old a sea dog to learn new tricks. Only once, just for a second, did she display any sign of temperament. It was after a long sail. A fog had come up, and Rena was as clammy as a shower curtain. We had missed the mooring on the first go-round, and the captain was in an ugly mood. We made the mooring all right on the second try. The captain, as was his custom, was standing in the stern, merry rope in hand, shouting orders about lowering the sail. Just before the sail came down, a squall hit Rena, and she retaliated by whipping her boom savage, savagely across the hull. The captain saw it coming, but didn't have time to duck. The boom caught him on the side of the head with a terrible clout, a blow hard enough to lift him off his feet and tumble him, stomach first, into the water. The captain didn't come up for almost a minute. The crew, while losing little love, for their captain, became frightened for their daddy. We were just about to dive in after him when a pair of feet emerged from the water and the toes wiggled. We knew everything was all right then. The feet disappeared and a few moments later, dad came up head first. His nose was bleeding, but he was grinning and didn't forget to spit the fine stream of water through his front teeth. The bird they call the elephant, he whispered weakly, and he was dad then, but not for long. As soon as his head cleared and his strength came back, he was the captain again. All right, you red lobsters of ass there, he bellowed. Throw your captain a line and help haul me aboard. Or shiver my timbers, I'll take a belaying pin to the swab who lowered the boom on me. And that is the end of chapter 12. And tomorrow night, we will continue with chapter 13. Have a good night, everyone.